Again, uh, hello again, and thank you sincerely for joining in this grim time. And welcome to Palestine Speaks with the Green Olive Collective, All That's Left, and Khatamim, an emergency webinar series giving people around the world a forum to hear directly from Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank about the ways their communities are being impacted by recent events, about the escalating violence they are experiencing, and about the urgent need for an immediate ceasefire and the end of collective punishment. My name is Erez Bleicher, and I'm the Communications and Membership Director of the Green Olive Collective, a binational advocacy, information, and tour guiding cooperative committed to a democratic future and an end to the ongoing displacement of Palestinians. We provide communities around the world with insights into the apartheid policies of the occupation and the resources to engage in meaningful advocacy and solidarity with Palestinians. Following the heart-wrenching events of these last days, I've been reminded of a biblical passage in Jeremiah that I referenced at the start of our first emergency webinar this last week and would like to reference again. Death has climbed in through our windows and has entered our abodes. It has removed the children from the streets and the young men from the public squares. As of today, approximately 1,500 Israelis and 4,000 Palestinians have been killed already since the violence began. We are grieved and our hearts are with the families who are contending with irrevocable loss. It is impossible to contain all of the anguish of this moment in one instant, but we are determined to insist particularly now and today that occupation can only bring despair. The only way to end this collective anguish is to build a future of mutual prosperity beyond partition, occupation, airstrikes, ground invasions, and apartheid. Only freedom, equality, solidarity, and an end to the siege of Gaza can bring a future of dignity for all. We're joining together today and weekly through this emergency webinar series as a global community of solidarity across checkpoints, barbed wire, closed military zones, and border walls. The occupation regime does all it can to fracture Palestinian society, to isolate them from each other and the world, and to contain Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank in physical and imaginative cantons whose borders cannot be breached. We intend these weekly gatherings as a breach of those borders and an expression of solidarity, empathy, and common cause against the limits of the dominant discourse set by Biden and Netanyahu. We are very glad to have with us today dear friends from Janin, Jerusalem, and Masat el Yatta to hear from them in their own words about the ways their communities are being impacted by recent events and about the escalating violence they are experiencing in real time. We're also glad to have in one forum partners from Area A, Area C, and Jerusalem who are each placed under distinct jurisdictions by the partitions and segregations of the occupation. We are infinitely grateful to them for joining to speak with us directly in this urgent moment about the reality on the ground. Uh, and now I'll say a few words about each of our speakers, our three speakers today. Um, thanks to each of you. Our first speaker I'll introduce is Mustafa Sheta. He is the general director of the Janin Freedom Theater, a lauded institution that offers drama and performance art education in the heart of the Janine refugee camp. The community-based theater and cultural center was established in 2006, and since that time has aimed to generate cultural resistance as a catalyst for social change in the occupied territories. The goal of the theater is to, quote, develop a vibrant and creative artistic community that empowers children and young adults to express themselves freely. It was featured in the globally acclaimed documentary, Arna's Children, that perhaps some of you have seen and has continued to represent a unique voice in public discourse surrounding Palestine. I am grateful that Mustafa is here with us today to speak about the theater, his experiences, and recent developments in Janine. Our second speaker is Samia Hareini. She is the founder of the Mothers of Sumud project in Tawani in the South Hebron Hills, a women-led project which resists land theft in Area C of the occupied West Bank. She is a powerful advocate on behalf of her community, and against military and settler violence in Masafi Ayatta. I have known her at least since 2018 through the networks of trust and solidarity residents of Masafi Ayatta have cultivated since the Second Intifada. 
and since that time have known her as a person of deep integrity and conviction. She seems to maintain an incredible clarity of purpose and a sense of steadfastness, even through the most dire of circumstances. And I'm really very, very glad she is here with us today to give updates directly from Tawani and the South Edmund Hills. Our final speaker is Mohammed Barakat, the uh, Green Olive Senior Partner, a Green Olive Senior Partner and my colleague. He is a second generation refugee whose family was expelled from their homes outside Jerusalem in 1948. He has worked in Palestinian labor unions, hospitality and tourism for many decades and maintain strong relationships with the villagers, farmers, and agricultural communities of the Jordan Valley, South Urban Hills, and other areas of Area C. He has been a witness to the major events of the last decades in the region, including the Six-Day War and both intifadas. I've been honored to work with Mohammed in the Green Island Collective and have learned tremendously from the historical and contemporary perspective he provides. Um, and that, with that, I'll lead into today's conversation the way I think I'll structure this, um, Mohammed, Samiha, uh, and Mustafa, is by asking a, an, a question and then having each of you answer a panel of sorts. Um, so I think, Mustafa, I'll start with you, I think, for the first question and ask. Uh, well, firstly, thank you so much again for joining in this devastating time. Um, and I wanted to ask you to begin, please, by telling us about yourself. What's your name? Where are you from? What is the Janine Freedom Theater? And what do you see as the role of the Freedom Theater and of art and drama as part of resistance to the occupation? First of all, thank you for uh, hosting me and uh, to raise my voice through this platform. And it's really my pleasure to be with you. My name is Mustafa Shita and I work uh, as general manager of the Freedom Theater. And uh, it's really, for me, it's, uh, it's like really working uh, in very important uh, cultural uh, center in, in, in Palestine, whereas we focus for the, the idea of uh, cultural resistance and the idea for the uh, Palestinian identity and how we can improve and uh, improve in this, uh, in this item and this concept about uh, common a Palestinian identity and uh, how that's really uh, help, in fact, to understand the, all the condition and all the situation for in Palestine uh, through creative work and through creative uh, uh, action in engineer refugee camp where we are live here. Uh, and this this theater, in fact, established with the Jewish people. And I think you make uh, some introduction about that. With, with, but we talk about something really close to us, close to our heart when we talk about ourselves here. Uh, the Freedom Theater already established with Arna Merchamis, when, and uh, she's a really brave Jewish woman, came to Jenin and established the Childhood Center. And uh, me and my colleagues, uh, in fact, we grow up in her Childhood Center and now be like a leaders in the in this cultural center now in Jenin Fiji Camp. And the idea, in fact, it's about the, the main uh, of this uh, conflict and the, or this occupation, this colonialism in Palestine, and about stolen the land and all of that, and how we, the Freedom Theater, and how the worker focus on it, uh, on this issue, in fact. Uh, we are live in the in this cultural center in, uh, we can say, in difficult area, uh, where we are live in Jin refugee camp. The majority, all the people, in fact, they are refugees. They are, uh, take, uh, they, uh, Israel take off them from their original homeland. And we are live, I mean, in political and geographic area. And all, all the time, the discussion and the speech, all the time talk about uh, the, the political issue and uh, the solution for uh, in, the, and in the incubation, right of return, and all of this issue. And her, it's not easy sometimes to work in, uh, you know, in cultural action without to take all of this uh, and consider all of this in your, uh, in your work in, in Jenin. We need, we need to work in, 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 in the concept of freedom itself. It's, it's really sometimes it's, it's sometime it's hard and difficult. Uh, especially now we, we talk about uh, we are live under incubation and incubation sometimes make the people under the incubation think by in uh, by in different subjects and uh, not prepare their priorities by good way we, we, we can say so when we talk about for example the free freedom concept all the freedom concept it's uh, 
it's not easy, in fact, especially with the conservative, conservative society when we talk about right for it, right, uh, human rights and women rights and uh, right for the minority in, in, in different societies and about different issues. In fact, it's uh, not easy. Provide a space for men and women here, it's not easy. But the, the main uh, clashes or the main problem here, we think it's uh, uh, the incubation and the, uh, how the incubation continue in our homeland and it stole everything. It stole this narrative and how we can face all of that. And that's one of our main mission, in fact. Uh, we consider ourselves as freedom fighters, in fact, and what we use this cultural action and the, our theater, the stage, it's what it's uh, our uh, our battle, our main battle, in fact, to for knowledge, for information, for education, for all of that issue, and uh, in fact, that's uh, that's important for us, and we think our work is uh, considered like a main step for the revolution and for resistance, and depend on that, we continue in this subject, and we continue uh, with the we, we can say with full uh, uh, faith and believe about uh, how we can really make impact. With, uh, within in our society and among our society. So we work under this uh, philosophy. It's artivism, art for social change, art and activism together. And, I'm, and I think that's really important for how, how this road, how we can lead this road to achieve uh, uh, something. Uh, especially, you know, uh, during this uh, war and the clashes and the invasions uh, happened uh, sometimes really daily. It's, we, we deal with that sometimes. We are, now we, we consider ourselves really as abnormal people where we deal with the invasion and the attack. Sometimes it's like normal attack or normal event. Uh, for example, that's what happened in this day, in fact, in this morning when Israel uh, target mosque and killed two people. And, and I think sometimes Israel, they now they change their policies against the Palestinian. They really focus not to arrest the people, to kill the people now. I mean, for example, if they know where is the, between quotation, the wanted people, they can arrest them, but they decide to kill them. And that makes the feeling all the time about that, it's a revenge feeling about how we can continue and we continue to fight. And, uh, you know, the, we talk about now the value of the human being here, about how we can continue in, uh, through all of that's a problem. And uh, it's not easy, but uh, we think it's a, uh, it's important to have theater. And I think all of that, it's like introduction about the rule of the theater during this time. Uh, we focus for uh, protect the mental health and the th and pass through the trauma having their direct, their daily and regular uh, problems in, in, in our area. Thank you, Mustafa. I'm excited to hear more from you today about the ways you've grown up in the theater and the role of cultural resistance and creativity in challenging the dynamics of occupation. Um, and when I spoke to you on the phone earlier today, in fact, I hadn't known at that time that there had been an airstrike. So I'll ask you more questions soon about what is happening, what you've seen these last weeks in Janine. Uh, but first, I want to uh, pass it to um, Samia Hureni, who is here with us from Masakoyata, and ask you, Samia, to please introduce yourself, say your name, where you're from, uh, and what kind of works, work you do as a resident and human rights defender in Masakoyata. Hi, dear. How are you? Hi, Hi, everyone. Well. I'm Samiha Hulaini. I'm a youth activist in uh, Masaf Riyatta. I'm a member of a group of Youth of Sumud, Youth of Steadfastness. Samia, because sorry to interrupt. Is it possible for you to have the video also or not at this time? Totally fine. No. That's why I'm closing the camera because the connection would be so bad. I see. Okay, then please continue. Completely understood. Yeah, uh, so we as a group, we are defending our rights in the Masafriyatta area and the other area that we can reach in the West Bank. So we start our activism in 2017 in order to uh, restore it and uh, all the villages that was evicted in the 90s. And we start from there as youth people in the area to take our responsibility to help our communities and our people to take their voices and stories and messages for uh, the international community to see what's happening, what's going on in Masafriyata, especially that this area is unknown. That was make it more difficult for us to make the people know about the area and what's happening here, even for the Palestinian people, not just for the international community. Uh, I mean, because we are so far, we're in the south area and the West Bank, we, our area is extended as the Union line borders, so our people are living kind of deserts. 
because of this area, uh, it's also a uh, borders area, which is so close for 48 and for Jordan. Uh, so we try to uh, turn on the light in the human rights violation and the occupation attacks and crimes from the settler and the soldier in the suffering of the from uh, home demolishing, uh, uh, checkpoints, and attacks, arrested, night raids, and day raids, and shooting of people and killing people in front of their houses and their families, which is so important. And the important thing is to empower and strengthen the rule of women in the area. This is one of the main things that I'm focused in. Uh, with the with the group as a young lady living in Masafriata. Uh, so I hope uh, this uh, briefly, this is what I do and who I am and I'm who I'm working with. Thanks, Samia. And I'm excited to hear more from you about Youth of Samud and the work that you do. Uh, I just wanted to ask you quickly, if you can, to share a few more words about Masafriata. I'm sure there are people here who are familiar with the region and some who are not. Can you say a few words about what is Masafriata? Yeah, so as I mentioned before, Musafriata is located in the south of West Bank. Uh, we are in the south uh, area in Palestine. Uh, our area is um, considered by the Israeli Authority as a closed military area, sorry for military training and settlements and firing zone area. And the people here is built out living in small villages and caves and tents because of the oppression of the Israeli occupation who are not allowing them even to have a normal houses to live in. So people are having only the choice of living in caves and tents. I'm living in Fwani village, which is the gate of Mataferiato. Luckily, we have a master plan. Master plan means that we have a kind of plan that we can build and have a normal street and electricity and water that we try to pass to the other villages, but always it got stopped to be passed for other people in Masafariata. We have the only school in Masafariata, which is another uh, children from other villages have to come to Tuani, where I live to study and uh, come to, to their school. So Masafariata is an area of uh, small villages and communities spread out, living in between settlements and extremist settler. And it's a sea area, which is the full control of the Israeli authority. And it's fully controlled by the settler and the army by because they're just uh, living uh, next door of us, five minutes far away of our houses and villages. So uh, there was a daily of attacks and daily of facing the settler and soldier in the field, in the house, everywhere. And the people in Masafariyat are following the farmer lifestyle. Uh, all the people are just farming and working in the field and access to their land, which is now so, so difficult for them to access their land because of the expansion of the settlements that's happening every day in Masafariata and the land of people got lost and stolen by the settlers who are starting to expand and take this land as a part of the settlements. So uh, this is the lifestyle of people in Masafariata. Uh, the situation is very difficult, especially after May 2022, after the order of eviction aid for Palestinian village from Masafariata, and people are now suffering just uh, to resist to stay home, and uh, which is just shelter and caves. Uh, and this uh, actually order was happening in the 19th, but the Israel uh, courts are doing it now in 2022, in May, which is giving uh, people the red line to leave the area. And now they're trying to use their land and their village and their houses as a military training point. And the settlers are feeling that they have the green line to be more active in these villages after this order, which means that giving them more, uh, more space to keep attacking people because of the Israeli court who are giving them the green light to evict these people. So they are using the more violent way and using the most violent way to evict and kick these people outside. We are speaking about 1,500 Palestinians uh, will be refugees and homeless again. Uh, and we are worried that it will be a new Nakba is gonna happen in Masafariyata. And this is what the people are fearing and scaring. And they are talking to themselves that maybe the bulldozers any moment just go down and kick them out of these villages and in their Thanks. houses. Thanks, Samiha. I, and we'll come back to you shortly to hear more about how settler violence and military violence has escalated in the last weeks. Um, just so people know, I, we've been using a, the terms Area A and Area C on the call, and many on this call are unsure familiar with those uh, jurisdictions and territories, but maybe some are not. So I just wanted to clarify that in the West Bank, 
since uh, the Oslo Accords in 1994, the territory has been separated into areas A, B, and C. Area C is under the full security and civil authority of the Israeli military. According to the Oslo Accords, area B would be under the security control of Israel, but the civil control of the Palestinian Authority. And area A would be under the civil and security control of the Palestinian Authority. However, the terms have not been kept, and it's important to say that Israel and the Israeli military is the sovereign throughout the territory, though the ways that occupation uh, in, implements itself between those areas is different, which we'll learn more about today. Uh, Samia, if you could quickly say one or two sentences about the mothers of Sumud Garden, I would love for people to know, and then I'll move over to Mohammed to introduce himself. Yes, uh, of course. I'm sorry if it was taking so long for me. Uh, no. Yes, Sumud Garden, it's uh, a land located it's for my family land. It's in front of the settlements of Havat Ma'on in Tuani village. It's under threat to be confiscated and be using as a part of the settlements and be with the expanding that's happening in Masafariata. Um, this piece of land was seriously being taken by the settlers by their activity in the, this land daily by also bringing their sheep, their donkeys, and being in, in this land and cross it with their cars and with their dogs. It's in order to uh, confiscate this land. So the uh, idea was born around three years ago, is how we can protect this land from this plan. Uh, so we create uh, this project uh, called Mother's Sumut Garden, uh, related for my grandma, who passed away uh, in July 2022 also. Uh, and she was the main one who was supporting us to do this. Uh, and uh, we give the name of Mothers of Sumud, Mothers of Sitfastness, to give uh, more support for the women in the area to have at least a space of land or piece of land that they can use their time in and have it as a garden or a place that they can enjoy and having their time because here in Masafiata we have no uh, places like park or some places that they can uh, have their time or enjoy. You have some one is very close to the school, which is so small. We were just thinking how we can create an idea to protect this land and be more active and bringing people. Uh, but uh, sadly, uh, it was uh, attacked badly by the settlers because they don't want this idea to be succeed or this land can be used by, by anyone, even Palestinian or anyone else. But uh, we do a very, very uh, wonderful work of cleaning of rocks and planting trees. And we plant more than 83, but all was uprooted and cut it by the settlers. And we tried to build also a stone wall, but it was, also was removed with the bulldozers last week with the hard situation that we are passing with the war right now. And now the garden is under their full control because of the war situation. And we are so scared about what will happen next step. But where I'm going and we're trying to protect this piece of land with a very difficult situation that we are passing in as all of Palestine. So I don't want to take more long for Mohammed, so I will pass it for you. Thank you, Samiha. It's an incredible project and I've admired the work you've done there for many years and I've been happy to come with others to support. I'm excited you. to hear more shortly. Um, Mohammed, do you want to introduce yourself and say who you are, where you're from, and the kinds of advocacy and human rights work that you do? Well, good evening to all. Uh, so I'm Mohammed Barakat. I'm uh, a Palestinian of the second generation of the refugees. I was born in the old city of Jerusalem uh, to a family which they fled out of their homeland. Uh, it's a small village close to Jerusalem because of what happened a day before they just fled out. The massacre of Deir Yassin, which caused all um, the movement or the floods of the villagers of all the village villages around Jerusalem. That was the main cause of those uh, of um, what happened after that massacre. That the people started to run away from their villages just to go to have a shelter, and that's what happened to my family. So they went to another village to have a shelter for a while. They spent more than two weeks waiting if they will had a chance to get back to their homeland. Never happened. So they moved to the old city of Jerusalem, and that's where they stayed. And I had been born later on. I was uh, an eyewitness over the war of 1967. I was living in Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood on the borderline. So I remember things how it used to be before and up to today. I got married in 75. I have five children, which those are the third generation. Beside them, I have 
12 grandchildren. So those are the fourth generation of the refugees. So my story is similar and similar to all those uh, Palestinians since 1948. Now, uh, we in several times we had the chance with an Israeli NGO, it's called Zikhrut, to do the commemoration of the commemoration of the Yassin massacre as a way to bring it back to the uh, to show it to the others of what happened in Jerusalem, what happened in Deir Yassin, uh, to clear about the that type of killing which happened in 1948. I started to work in the tourism. Uh, tourism sector through the working in a hotel in East Jerusalem. Uh, it's called the National Palace Hotel, which is uh, used to be through the first uh, uprising. It was the main meeting point for all those officials, for those all activists in uh, in Palestine even. Uh, I quit, dropped down working in the hotel. I started to do the work of um, touring around in, in the country with the uh, seeing the people's situation since 1997, having the alternative tours. Uh, I started that with several uh, colleagues and then I joined the Green Olive in 2010, nine, some of that, and I still working with those people since that, since that time. I had chance to drive in all over the country meeting more of those people, hearing more stories and seeing it uh, clearly what's happening in the country. So as I told you, since 1967, I'm an eyewitness of things have been changed through the years of my life. So spending 56 years of my life under occupation without finding my identity as a, as a human being, I am carrying an identity card from the Israelis considering me as permanent residents of Jerusalem, which is our status, is different than the others of the West Bank because also those people are considered residents of the West Bank and Gaza. So we are not even, we are not considered to the Israelis our people of the country. We are almost in any moment they can just kick us out. And this is what is happening now in, in Gaza. Sorry, uh, because... I don't think that the Israelis, since 1994, when we had the chance to go on with the peace process, I, I thought that the Israeli society at that time was happy on moving towards it. But later on, I discovered that after the second uprising, that things went down after the assassination of Mr. Rabin, even though it was much harder to, to find some of those courageous Israelis to go on with uh, the peace process. So since that time, it's dropping down and we are seeing what is the effects which happened of the failure of the peace process, which is now it's happening by killing more of those Palestinians in Gaza and uh, making it much darker for our future as Palestinians, indig indig indigenous people of the country that we are now considered as strangers. So this is a sub part of what is happening. And I will even share you what happened with me yesterday, doing a tour with the uh, in, a journalist team through the West Bank and discovering something different than that I used to see that my country is. Because we are living now under military rules, which is very hard for us uh, to, you know, to, you know, to move in our movement is we are completely tied. Uh, even in our uh, way of Seeing each other is too hard nowadays. And um, it's it's really um, one of the main dark time of my life. I'm seeing it nowadays, it's happening. And I'm seeing the, really the, uh, the re, you know, the, the revenge uh, sites of the Israelis, uh, mainly the security forces and the settlers, which I had met them yesterday by chance, I could see the, how much stretched they are and even not giving us any chance of just showing ourselves out. So- Thanks, Mohammed. I think- I... Go ahead. No, I'm excited to hear about your experiences more. I just wanna, that's the next question. So I think I'll start the next round and have each of you share now about what you've been seeing this last week. 
So if you if it's okay, I'll have you wait just a moment and then please do share the story from yesterday. Okay. Um, but just to go through and there's too much to say in this moment. There's it's such a charged and impactful and historic moment happening with so many implications and so many bleak realities playing out. We can't possibly say all of it in one hour, um, but I'll ask everyone to please, as much as they can, share uh, with the people around the world. There are close to 200 people on this call standing in solidarity with all of you. So I'll pass it back to you, Mustafa, and then we'll hear from everyone again. And I wanna ask now specifically about um, what you've experienced and seen since the start of this war in Janine, Mustafa. What are the challenges of this time and of escalating violence for your community and in the Janine Freedom Theater? And can you please tell us what the conditions are around you and how people are being impacted so we can share your words with others around the world? Okay, I think now we have a new uh, air, in fact, in this, uh, in this conflict in general. I mean, now we need to think about uh, find a new definition for this uh, situation in Palestine. Uh, all the time we are as a Palestinian, we try to be like in the middle sometime to find the solution, peace uh, solution and all of that issue. And that comes through our government, through Abu Mazen and the Palestinian Authority and all of that. But uh, and uh, but that's for me, it's as as I, I am one of the people, I'm now 43 years old, and I I, I was born in uh, in 80, and then when I was just seven years old, I faced the first intifada, and after that I grow up with the all the time with the clashes, and I don't have this uh, child uh, life, you know, child, uh, in, to be like a normal uh, child, kid in all my life. I mean, and my I have children now, and I really sometimes blame myself because I bring the new people to this area, whereas all the time maybe are in dangerous uh, condition, uh, our situation. And uh, depend on that, in fact, I mean, we need to think about something related with what's mean resistance and what how we can deal with that and how the international community and about the East and the West relationship, uh, especially really we, I was shocked by the uh, news uh, media and the media, uh, inter international media, uh, when they already invite, invite us to ho and host us to be in some interviews to just to blame ourselves, to say we are stupid, we are wrong, and uh, we not to blame ourselves because we are Palestinian. I mean, it's about how we look for ourselves and how the, inter the people look for our, 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 the Palestinian themselves inside Palestine. Because the problem now, it's about how really dealing with us. As we, uh, are we are really human in, your, in, in the international uh, community eyes? Or we are like animal as the defense minister Israel, the defense minister, he consider us as a human animal, or animal human. Anyway, the idea now, it's really need to find a new definition. And that's about the feeling in general. We are in, in, in West Bank in, in general, especially in Jenin refugee camp. We passed through this condition from 2020. I mean, the world already was, the world, all the world, busy with the corona pandemic, but we are busy with Israel invasion and attack happened from the middle of 2020, where we faced something really uh, horrible and aggressive action against the Palestinian. When they tried to arrest the people, they killed a lot of people and we, they wanted all the, the majority of the Palestinian here. They arrested a lot of people here and they killed a lot of people. And the new generation or the people already go up with this kind of violence action, they are decide to revenge and to decide to join to the military action against Israel. And that's what, for example, for our new generation here, they lead this battle and the resistance in the refugee camp. The majority of those people, they are already born in 2002. I mean, they are young people and they're born in the, day, in the year where Israel invaded Jenin in 2002 and they destroyed and they uh, destroyed Jenin refugee camp and killed 53 persons in Jenin refugee camp, arrested thousands of the people from the, uh, uh, from this camp, small camp, and all the people, all the, you can't find any home or any house in Jenin, refugee camp without story with the incubation. Murder, prisoner, and all of that are destroy the houses and all of this. So the feeling in general, it's angry, miserable, disappointed from all the world, and you know, we are miserable because we trust with this kind of uh, uh, solution to give us independent state or dependent area, you know, but we lose all of that. Already we don't, we don't achieve this dream. 
just to live in safe condition and continue as a normal people. So the work, in fact, what, what, we, what we try to link between all the situation, make analysis and try to show the people what's what's happened, why we are here, what's what's happened with us as a Palestinian, how we can find the solution or how we can uh, we can say, look for the solution for this problem in Palestine. Why we are under occupation for all of these years? Where is the rule for the world about to end this occupation? Why you work as service Israel, as a makeup for Israel, to make Israel as a beauty, as a, a beauty uh, state? But it's really ugly. They make a lot of ugly action against the Palestinian. They ugly our mind itself. I mean, it's not just about themselves because their action against us, it's make us to think about to end our life, to stop her. We don't need to continue in this life without any hope, you know? We, we lose the hope. And this is really big problem for the people, for the young people. They don't have job. Israel make a siege in the whole West Bank. They don't allow for the young people to travel. Already the people in very difficult uh, economic situation. So sometimes they can't continue, uh, they can't continue to uh, complete their studies. So you, ca you can consider, I don't have anything, what I can do. I will destroy everything around me if I don't have anything. So that's one of the main issue. So what's happened after the war? The war, look, the people, all the people, because really they don't feel anything about anything. They don't trust for the Belgian authority and Abu Mazen president and the Biden, uh, Biden president and the UK government. So they decide, no, we are trust and resistance. We are trust for the fighters already in the ground. So after the war, the people, they think, yeah, this fight for or this battle for our dignity. We need the people to talk about the Belgian dignity now, to fight for something really touch us because all the time we are under this oppression, you know, under this oppression and th that must to stop. And uh, that's what we try all the time to, to show the people about the feeling. Yesterday, or not yesterday, in this morning, I woke up at 2 a.m. 2 a.m. with the rock in the middle of Jinil Fiji camp, killed two people. Why, how, uh, what's happened? And where is Israel busy? What? Why Israel? They did. They killed the people in Jenin, and they killed people in Nur Shams camp, and they at, 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 attacked Tobas, and they make invasion in 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 Jericho. What's happened? Why? Why all of this aggressive and this hate is feeling and action in in where's the Palestinian? They don't like to find any Palestinian really live in good condition or live as a normal. They don't like us to live us as a normal people continuing our life. Look, the majority of the people, the, the last sentence. The last no, I just sentence. want to ask you, take your time. I, I, I want to ask you to share a final thought or two, and then I'll, I'll move on to hear also from Samiha about what's happening in the okay. I know there's so much to say, and I appreciate so much of what you're saying. Thank you. But do you want to sh finish a thought? No, no, just I want to say something, maybe just to share something. I mean, the majority, for example, we are work here in Liberal Center. That means we are not okay with Hamas, ideological, you know, because Hamas, it's really just a party and we have a big problem in the social uh, issue. But in the fight of Israel, in the fight of Israel, we can't say what Hamas did is bad or something not good. You know, we know the result of all of that as, a, you know, for all the people consider that like terrorist action. For us, we can't consider that terrorist action because what's happened with us, as a Palestinian, it's all the time terrorist action. But no one blame Israel and say for Israel that's you must stop. In the same time, there is a big comparative now with the Palestinian about Ukrainian ca case and Palestinian case. No one stand with us all the time. You stand with the with the white people, but you ignore the people in the in the West, in the East. Uh, sorry, that's that's really big problem, and that's it's like a voice for the international community. What, at what time you want us to consider we are normal and equal in equal uh, level with another people in the world? And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Excited to hear more shortly. Um, and I just want to thank you for firstly highlighting what the feeling is on the ground. I think both you and Mohammed in Jerusalem highlighted the ways that the failures of the peace process and the reality breeds despair, makes people feel like they have no choices, no other choice. Um, that young people born in siege in Gaza under occupation in the West Bank have only known that in their lives. And the international community has not stepped in, has not shown the, the diplomatic solidarity, the grassroots solidarity necessary to create other possibilities, um, which is not to condone Hamas, but to say 
we must as an international community end this collective punishment in Jenin, in Jerusalem, in Gaza, and create a future without siege, without occupation, where there is equality uh, for all. Um, so very large conversations to have, of course. Uh, Samiha, I want to pass it to you and ask you to share with us what's really been happening in Masafirata since the war began. Um, settler and military violence has been a reality, unfortunately, in Masafirata for a long time, far before the last weeks. But what's the same now as before and what's different now in Masafirata? Yeah. Um... In Masafiyata, the situation is not better than any uh, other places in Palestine this period of time, especially when the war starts. Um, as I mentioned before, how was the situation in Masafiyata was even bad without war, but now start to be more worse for the uh, civilians, people also who are living in Masafiyata. Uh, just to give more details. I will mention the important stuff that were happening and I think it will be enough for you to imagine the, the level of violence that the settlers are uh, using against people since the war starting until today. Um, now all the area of Masafariyata is locked and uh, all uh, the entrance of the area and going out is locked. And it's not easy to the people to enter or go out, even cars or, run, or anything else. Also, the entrance of the closest city, which is Yatta, which is all fully closed. It depends when the army want to be or not and open the street for people. And they are using very hard way to reach the city for their needs. Uh, I mean, for their daily needs, because Masafir is uh, it's just taking their needs from, from the city of Yatta. Um, so last week was the worst week I can imagine what happening for everyone in Tuani and Masafir because settlers were attacking people really crazy and the first um, situation was happening with my father when the uh, settler are just shooting against him and he was luckily to survive and this is was very big shock for me and for my family so it's maybe be more close for you an important example to ex explain for you from some people who experienced the direct attack for their homes and as i mentioned the mound is just five minutes far away than our houses and then they attack my dad badly with a gun, and he was again have his hand uh, uh, hardly attacked. Uh, to know that my my dad was attacking in his arm, and both of his arm was broken in September 2022. And this is, was also one of the experiences that we were about to lose our dad in these attacks, and killed attacked by the settler that they are believing in hate and killing Palestinian people because they are believing that you as Palestinian have no right to stay in Masafiyata. So they are just using the ethnic cleansing way and the eviction of people uh, and displacing people from Masafiyata. And my cousin who was shot from zero distance by a settler in Friday after he finished his prey in the mosque and uh, fully gunned the settler just entered the village and he shot him from zero distance and the army was protecting him. Uh, and people were shocked to see that. And we also, when we hear the shooting, we we cannot believe that my cousin was just shooting and we were about to lost him. And now he is still in the hospital and his situation is very, very difficult because his, his shot, it was just from zero distance. This is what was happening. And this is small examples about what the settlers are doing in Masafariyata. They are raiding the houses almost daily and they are just looking to to the phones of people, even to, to check it if you are supporting Hamas or you are supporting uh, the situation that's happening in Gaza, if you are publishing stuff, they're just uh, raiding the houses, taking your phone and open it and searching any things you have in your phone. If you are uh, just publishing in your uh, social media accounts like Instagram or Facebook, if you are supporting what's going on and what you are following about the war. So it's it, it just... Yesterday, when they go down for our neighbor house and they took all their phones and they destroy it, and there was two international present, uh, two people from the international community, and they also take their phones and they destroy it, they check it, and they just your private phone, they just go on your side, your house, take it, and and look in it just uh, in case that you are supporting something related to Hamas, so you are uh, as a terrorist and you should be killed or you should be arrested. So this is how it's difficult in Masafariyata right now. People cannot sleep during the night. They're all stay awake until the morning and late hours. 
just uh, to to be ready if the settler raid the houses of people and because you know this the villages are full of kids and women and people who are having full family and they're they know how much badly can the settler attack also yesterday they raid the village of Tuba they attacked this lady with her daughter they're alone in the house and they used to kill sheep and the animals they don't care about who is they just want to let you know that they are here and then they want to attack everyone and kill and shoot everyone. It's really scary that now they have the fully green line to kill uh, and to shoot people. So when they shoot my cousin, it's just in a, you know, clawed blood and he was not even worried about it because he know that he's fully protected by the soldier. Even the people who was around my, my, my cousin, they don't manage to do anything. They were so scared even to help him because from everywhere there is a gun, it's ready to shoot. So it's really, I don't know, the death, uh, people are feeling the death is everywhere. And uh, we are all sorry about what's happening in Gaza right now. And we're all standing with them. And we hope that it's going to end one day because people there are, are forming bombed and, you know, facing bombed and houses be, be destroyed, uh, you know. Uh, on top of them, kids get killed, the babies get, you know, I cannot see even these videos which published in the social media. We are now also scared from what's happening here, but it's be more worse and worse with every day pass with this war. I don't know where's the end or until when, but we hope it will be a point for all of this. And there is justice for these people who are just normal civilians who just get killed. In Masafariyata, also people are standing with Gaza, but you cannot even go outside of your house and taking a flag in your hand because you will be shot. If you want just to go for your neighbors or someone, there is army are following you to see what, what is your movement for, what are you doing? My mom just went to the greenhouse take care of the of her vegetables and they they were about to shoot her they are really crazy and they give the green line for shooting and killing people and they don't care who even like man woman kids they don't care so seriously here it's very very bad as it is in everywhere in palestine and i'm really sorry about all the stuff that's happening we are praying every day that this could end soon i have no more words actually to explain for all of you, what is really how it's really difficult to even to speak about it because it's like, it's our life and we are talking about our reality and our private story that's happening. For example, when they raid my my family house and they were about to kill my dad, it's something not easy for me to keep repeating or telling. But it's our real real, real life, you know, that we should people should hear it and speak about it and we should we should share it because these cr crimes and this oppression that the people live under it it should end not being more supported by even the international community or anyone else thank you samiha for sharing i want to say again how much we and i appreciate your coming to share with us during this devastating time and we are with you in calling for justice and an end to displacement in the south Yata and throughout Palestine. Um, and I, I think from what I've heard, I've been connected and visiting the communities in Masafayata for years. And it seemed to me this past week and these past weeks, uh, it's almost, uh, I thought, in a way, I've started to think about it even as a, a Gazification of the West Bank, where we can't come as easily to see in person. For years, we haven't been able to go to Gaza. Now it's even worse, um, but now uh, phone calls like this are sometimes the only way we can communicate with everything happening. Um, and people can't get medicine, and uh, people can't get the goods they need, as you've said. The army is really using this, like you've said, as a time to accelerate their efforts to displace the communities. Um, and in this moment, there's a feeling from the settlers and the army that they have total impunity and can do whatever they want. Um, so I don't know if you have any responses to what I just said, um, but I just wanted to say that um, people here on this call will take the perspective you're giving and the insight about what the reality is that's on the ground and you are living and uh, share it with others to build solidarity and demand that all of this ends and that justice uh, be created. Um, I want to turn now to Mohammed, and so very sorry to have to cut each of you off, given all the immensely important things you're all saying. Um, 
Mohammed, can you tell us what you're seeing in Jerusalem, what's happening around you, how people are being impacted? And also, I know that yesterday you were in the north and that you often travel to the north. Tell us what you're seeing um, since the war began and what the conditions are around you that are the same and different than before. Well, um, sorry to tell you, Jerusalem is living in sadness. Uh, there is no chance even to talk to the people themselves. They are, uh, they are worried about their lives and they are worried about the sentences, the words that they will just, if you want to interview them, you know, with the um, media, they won't answer because they are afraid. The statement which comes out of you, it will be a case against you. So people are very disappointed and uh, really uh, feeling that the, the world has just dropped them out and no one cares about what's happening. Uh, we are seeing what is happening in the world and uh, what's when it, when it comes to Palestine, things will change. Democracy will be will disappear. Human rights will disappear, and this is why we are worried about it. Uh, as an eyewitness over what is happening, so this is the as I told you the darkest moments of my life to see it happening. Um, there is no schools in Jerusalem nowadays. It's not running. Maybe tomorrow they will start. I don't know if they will have it. Uh, shops are mostly closed most of the time. Uh, we are afraid because we have. Settlements just close to us, and sometimes it happened that some of those settlers will come at night, midnight, uh, driving through the, our neighborhoods. If they if they will see somebody by himself, they will just jump on him and that you know beat him, which happened. So uh, uh, it's really a dangerous time for us, and uh, we are just stick at home, watching the TV, seeing what's happening. And uh, we're seeing the madness of power. Uh, killing more showed that you are so strong without giving a concern about the kids, children, families. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you this is, I, I, you know, War 67 was just such as a, a game which happened, you know, it's not a war. Uh, no wars happened uh, as I'm seeing nowadays, none of them. Is just showing how ugly is killing. So we are against the wars and all over, but we need, as Palestinians, to feel that we are a human being. We need our freedom. We need our human rights. This is what we are calling for, not more than that. Uh, as I told you, I'm witnessing a lot of things. You know, since the Oslo Accords Agreement, which I want to clear it to you because as a, as a way to understand why we in the West Bank, Jerusalem, in Gaza, we are so worried for our future because we could see that people were just seeing it happening without having any accountability to Israel. According to the Oslo Accords Agreement, the, uh, the occupied territories have been divided for three areas, A, B, and C. A, which is the main cities in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, to, have, to be under a full Palestinian control, civil and uh, security, which comes to be less than 18% of the occupied territories, which is important to understand it. Area B, which is the towns, villages around the main cities, it came to be under a full Palestinian civil control. Security, according to the agreement in 1994, should be run by joint forces, by Israelis and Palestinians. And that area comes to be less than 22%. So what have been left, which is over 60%, comes to be Area C, under a full Israeli military control. That, But according to the agreement, it should run for five years. Through the five years, part of C will move to B and part of B to A. Within the five years, Almost 70% should be an area A. What will be left over to negotiate for? It was Jerusalem status, the border with Jordan, the water resources, and also the refugees issues. That will be for the final negotiations. Imagine in 1994 when we started the peace process in area C, we used to have more than 400,000 Palestinians and less than 150,000 Israeli settlers. After the failure of the peace process that we are living in nowadays, 
In Area C, we have over 600,000 Israeli settlers and less than 150,000 Palestinians. That changed the whole situation. And that gives more power to the settlers to take more of the land. And instead of moving out, dismantling the settlements, they are building new ones. Uh, I, through my tours, I every day could see that they are adding another caravan, another mobile house, taking more of the land, putting it in over and taking more of the land property of the Palestinians. That caused a lot of you know, trouble for the Palestinians. They could see that their land, their properties are being taken by the settlers without any kinds of sanctions against the Israeli government as a way to put pressure uh, over them to stop the acts of the settlers, even though the new the, the new minister of the national security in Israel have given the right to those people to 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 have a militants groups from the settlers and to arm them, and he was so happy to that he had just distributed twenty seven arms to those people to take the law by their hands. And that's what happened yesterday in Hawar. They went down and they started to stone the people, get into the families, burning their cars and properties. It, I was, it was the first time that I drove out from my home since the two weeks of war, the last two weeks. I drove with the TV group from Switzerland to show part of Palestine, what is happening in the West Bank. On the way, it was the first time to see the streets. It reminded me with the second uprising. There were about numbers, few numbers of cars driving on road 60. The, because all the access of the roads from the Palestinian towns and villages have been closed by the checkpoints, the barriers, and the land mounds that Israel had put it. So, Seeing more of the things that I have been watching it long time ago, getting into the Hawara after we passed a an Israeli military checkpoint on the junction of Hawara, a junction of uh, we call it uh, Zatara, they call it Tabu in, in in their language in Hebrew, and the army over there stopped us and they were just just shouting, "Go back!" and so on. Tell the lady. You know, the uh, journalists went down and showed them their card, which is the Israeli card had been given to them, tag as, as a press. So the, he came and apologized for us as for the, his temper, you know, his way of acting against us. So we drove down. It was the first time to me since 1997 while I was doing, doing the tours to see Hawara in this shape. It was completely closed as a curfew. No one on the roads, no, no shop is open, nothing. I have seen only one person in Hawara's road, which is a, a road which the Israelis, because yesterday it was Saturday, so there were no settlers on the roads. Only the yellow license plates had been given the right to drive on the road, which is the Israeli vehicles. I went to Burin, which is a Palestinian village south of Nablus, and met a, a family which they were picking their olives in area C. So we spoke with them, we had a tea with them, and then we left them, and they were just close to an outpost, the land that they are, uh, and their trees is. And we drove back to through Hawara, back to, towards the Jordan Valley. I got a call from him, from the guy that I met, that the, the army have attacked them. So they left their work and left back to their homes instead of picking their olives. So this is part of the daily life that we are having. And to continue to go to the uh, my my you know the the tour with the uh, with the uh, journalists, we went to the Jordan Valley. We met the fam we met with a family, which usually I visit them, talking about the situation within the last days, you know, because of the war. It's very hard for them to stay. It's too dangerous. It's a family which they usually live by grazing their animals, you know, having their animals, sheep and goats and so on. Imagine that before, five years ago, they have plenty of land, grazing areas open for them. Suddenly, five years ago, settlers, two settlers came in to settle over there, taking more of the areas which had been open areas for the uh, grazing, taking it as only for them, 
preventing those people to get over there and shrinking the areas for those uh, farm, you know, shepherds. Now, I got a story from the lady over there, the mother. It's the first time that I have heard from her that settlers have been attacking her son and she went out to defend her son. Throwing stone at the settlers, she had been arrested, taken to interrogation, far away from her home, to an Israeli office, you know, police station in Ramallah area. It's called Givat Benjamin. Even she had a girl, baby, four months ago, four months old. So her husband with the baby just followed her to the police station. Where over there, the girl was crying, the baby all the time because she wants to get. Uh, you know, feed it but from her mother. So they gave her the right to, uh, you know, to feed her for a while and then they took her back. They kept her in interrogation up till one o'clock in the morning till they left her because she defended her son. Just imagine how things is terrible in this situation when the settlers are attacking you by yourself. There is no one to help you over there. And the army will be always on their side. So this is, was part of the things that we have seen it yesterday, hearing the stories of the people, seeing it in our eyes. Driving towards the Jordan Valley, where over there we want to see, you know, kinds of the life of the people on both sides, the settlers and the Palestinians' neighborhoods or Palestinians' community. There is one of those settlements, which is called Miswa. There is only a road between them, the settlement, and the Palestinian community, it's called Abu Ajaj. And you, could, you cannot imagine that over there you could see what we call it the apartheid, because just five meters between those two communities where the settlements are so green, people over there are having their beautiful life, they have their electricity, running water, everything, were on their side, just five meters away from them. People over there, they don't have running water. They have no electricity. They have no types of life. Even all the rubbish, the rubbish, all the uh, the dirt and the garbage of the settlements will be thrown on their side. Now, over there, the guy who was, you know, the camera guy was taking, shooting some film over there. The security stopped him. And they came towards us and saying, why, why you are here? We told them we are just shooting, seeing the green areas. So that you can't do here, here, leave. So we drove slowly. They want to, you know, the uh, the journalist wants to do a live stand show. I told her it's too hard to do it here because it's they will consider it as a private area. So we have to leave to road number 90, which is a main road. They followed us. Two Israeli security, you know, of the settlement cars followed us. And they just been following us after almost five miles driving, there was an Israeli border police car standing in the middle of the road and stopped us. The reason that the settlers have phoned them that we are running away, we have something, you know, something, not, you know, suspicious thing. So we had been stopped by the army, the border police, and they checked our ID cards and the, you know, the passports. And then they gave us our, uh, you know, passports and so on. So the lady asked them, why you are doing that? What's the reason? So that's security, you know, that we are in a war time. So it was so hard to understand the situation, even for the internationals, how those people could manage as security to do whatever they want. Getting into Jericho, it wasn't that hard to get in that time, but really it was hard to get out of Jericho. It took us more than two and a half hours on the checkpoint to leave from Jericho to Jerusalem. So imagine this situation that we are living in it nowadays. So Thanks hopefully- Thanks for things... If you want to finish a final thought, on, just for the sake of time, I have to move us along. Do you want to finish the sentence, please? And so well, I hope, that, I hope that things will clear. Uh, madness will stop. Killing will just stop. People, I, I, I admire and respect, which usually I could see that on YouTube and so on, some of those Jewish progressives, Jewish people in all over the world, standing with the Palestinians for their rights. 
I could believe this is something that gives us hope that things will change. And this is what we need, that people could start to do the change by coming out, shouting loudly that Palestinians have the rights to be recognized as a nation and a country for them. And this is what we need. So that's what we are willing you and hoping that you will carry on to go on to put more pressure on your governments as a way to provide us with peace and dignity and freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. And we hope and know that people here will take these words and carry them into their communities uh, and demand justice. And unfortunately, because there's so much rich uh, conversation to have and so many important things to contend with here, um, I want to ask just one last question for, from all of you, um, or maybe combine the last two I had because I can't help myself. Um, this last week on our first emergency webinar, um, we had a colleague from the Gaza Strip join. Uh, he wasn't able, unfortunately, we hoped he would be able to call into the Zoom, but the connection, understandably, didn't allow for it and the conditions in Gaza didn't allow. Um, but what he said on speakerphone to us is the following. The occupation is a weak system. It can't defeat feelings, the sincere feelings that we have. The one positive thing about this catastrophe is that it brings true friends together and it is true friendship and solidarity that is sustaining my hope and my ability to resist. Mohammed, you just touched on it also, but I wanna turn it back to you quickly, Mustafa, and ask, how does solidarity sustain your ability to resist? What is the role of solidarity in this moment? And how does it help us get to our vision of justice? And what is your vision of justice? Too many questions for the few short minutes I've asked you to say it. But if you okay. say a few final words, we'd be very grateful. I, I will try to smile all of that to say something <laughs> directly. Unfair uh, of me to ask. Thank you. Yeah. In fact, uh, what what I think now we need it we need it from the people, the friends of uh, of uh, Palestinian people to s share the real story and distribute our our real story for all the people. It's it's important now. It's important to face this uh, colonialism media agency. It's against us, against the Palestinian right to share real story with another people. Already we have friends uh, around the world. Yesterday there is seventy thousand person. In Barcelona, they made a big demonstration for Palestine, and they share that with us. There is a people from Chile. Now I have her, Elhandra. She's uh, our friends from Chile. She did the great work in, with her city there. In fact, it was really fantastic uh, work with the people from Chile to, to, to know about us. The solidarity now, it needs practical action, not just to say we are support Palestine, we are with you. We need really some time to make some action, to change everything. You know, we faced last, last three years, in fact, this conditional funding coming from the European Commission for the Palestinian that put us under big pressure just to say, just to sign for something considered the Palestinian struggle is terrorist. They ask us they asked the Freedom Theater in Engineer PG camp to consider the Palestinian struggle as terrorist. And we refuse that for sure. But I mean, look for this kind of methodology of the work with the Palestinian, how that's work. They, I give you money, then you want to change everything. You want to change your skin. You want to change your identity. You want to change your thought. And that's what I ask the international community. And that's the, ask the solidarity. We don't need to get money or fund or support from your side just to keep our, our, our uh, to keep the condition like this. We need support us to move, to get liberation. We need to work together to get liberation. The freedom for Palestine is not just for this area, not just for this geographic area. It's talk about the, the, the struggle for liberate Palestine. It's the freedom for all the people, for all the free people in the world. So this is important, in fact, if we consider if we consider the Palestinian uh, case is just for the Palestinian or for Arab or for the people who live in this area, that's for me nothing. It's for me, it's a global, a global issue. All the people will must be involved in this. So the action, it must to be more and more to make a change in the in the in the in, the, in your in your country policies. That's important. And in, in to 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 make uh, I mean the 
a more strong uh, parties or that's a, a, a folk uh, believe in Palestine right to more to make more action to change something in the in the country to stop support Israel to boycott Israel production or to boycott Israel at all I mean that's really important to just to say the real story about Palestine as as we see now I, as I am as we in my position I don't believe in Israel I don't trust in Israel I don't believe in political leaders in, 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 in from different parties but I believe for the people or real people they believe for the human being and for the human rights and they want to stand with the Palestinian we have this Palestine all this Palestine for us Haifa for Palestinian and Yafa for Palestinian Jerusalem for Palestinian and it's it's not to it's not the time to share something for it's it's I mean it's about the the the, the core of the real narrative from us as a, as a refugee we are living in the, in the camps with and we have the the full right to return to our original homeland. I mean it's really important it's really important for more action to support the Palestinian for the freedom theater already there is the people already share I heard here's Deborah from UK US too we can share something about the revolution of promise we can share with the theater makers with another with the people already focused for cultural action in different area we can share something with us now my colleague Ahmed Tubas in France and he, he did his play monodrama and here I am there and he make a, a small tour in different uh, cities in France and that's make some some you know some explanation about the situation in Palestine. The important now to return to the original and to to, to be clear and not to be, to live in this gray yard to just say yes, come on, you must to find peace, you must to find solution. We are under occupation, and the the, the only solution is in the occupation for whole Palestine and to think about Palestine by different way. And uh, that's for me. It's really important. The solidarity is important. And the last, the last sentence. I, I know I talk a lot, but the last sentence. I just want to say something really important for what's mean Palestinian revolution. And 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 believe that depend on three main points: resistance, resilience, and liberation. And that's what we work in all these three main points. We are resist and resilience. We are stand and we have some mood under this occupation and we fight all of the Palestinians we must fight for end the occupation and liberate Palestine. And uh, and that's that's really important and thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. And thank you for highlighting the ways we need to work for the collective rights of Palestinians. And the only solution, as you said, is the end of the occupation. Only that will bring a future with dignity for everyone. Um, Samiha, I want to turn to you and ask, you also uh, to share what you see as the role of solidarity right now, how solidarity helps you and people in Masafa Yata to continue and why solidarity will lead us to a future of justice. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, uh, it's the same message that we're always uh, sending for the international community and who are believing in the humanity and the human being far away than any other name of the uh, of what's happening in Palestine right now. I know how it's difficult to understand the reality as as people are far away than here and they cannot see what's happening in the grounds and what the people are leaving daily. And I think the image will not be completed except if we uh, just be and leave this kind of stuff uh, for for the international people who want to see. And we should be the eye of people here because the important goal for the Israeli occupation is to keep all these attacks hidden and covered to don't be show up for the, for the people who can give solidarity and standing with Palestine and the Palestine, Palestinian people here. Um, we as Palestinian, we will be separated because of the Israeli occupation goals. Like now, they make us West Bank and Jerusalem and Forty Eight and Gaza. This was make us more weak, even in in between us as Palestinians. It make us a bit. Uh, everyone was busy in the different strategy of attacks was happening in even different places. 
but we are uh, in the end under the same occupation and under the same strategy of attacks and we can understand the painful of other people who just get killed or arrested because it's the same happening in every piece in Palestine. So even we are in named separated, but in the goals and the unity of freedom and human rights and be a human, we're all in the same uh, in the same point and the same circle. So I'm always telling that please share our stories that we are sharing with you that because we are what we are telling you, it's our story and it's our life. It's not something we bring from story box. We are, we are talking about people who get shot and killed and arrested and night raids and day raids and they are living in, and the fear is entering every, in every single details of their lives. I mean, as you mentioned, one of the important things in Masafir Yata with health services that people cannot even reach easily. So when Zakaria gets shot, the entrance was closed. All the entrance of Yata was closed. He was about to die just in the street waiting for a soldier who was making the checkpoint to allow him to, to go to the hospital to, to be survived. So even this, your life is a soldier or a settler is deciding that if you can stay alive or not. So this is one of the important injustices that we are living under it. So please share it and let the international community and all the world know what's going on here. And, and that's what we need, actually. And we are all thanks for everyone who's sharing and keep talking about what's happening in Palestine, because I think 75 years old is enough of injustice and oppression, and no one is even cared about what's happening in Palestine. And I'm really worried that the war, every, every day is passing, that people or, or the world will take it something normally, you know, to see some kids get killed or babies get killed. It's not something normal that we have used to see. And the videos that it's published, it's not something just we can turn off our phones that it will end. It's something difficult to see and hard for us. We cannot sleep in the night when we see a video of babies get killed or get bombed or their their parts of body but was cutted. We don't want to, to that things be normal. So please share these stories and let the international community know about Do what's you? happening here and that we need your solidarity and support. Sorry, he's so <laughs> No need to apologize. Um, and thank you, Samiha. Uh, I think, as you said, and we said this at the start of this call also, the occupation regime does all it can to separate Palestinians from each other and also from the world. Um, and they don't want people to have relationships rooted in solidarity across contexts. So I'm glad to see us here together across local and international context in solidarity, working towards a vision of justice where this violence doesn't occur. And we need to deepen and grow and expand those relationships of solidarity and create the local and transnational movements we need um, to end this violence and create a future where the rights of everyone are honored and the inherent worth of everyone is honored. Um, Mohammed, very lastly, and unfortunately, we are only have a minute or two, so I'll ask, unfortunately, for you to keep it brief. Um, but can you tell us, for you, why solidarity is important, what solidarity uh, means right now in this moment, and how you feel we can arrive to uh, a vision of a just future? Are you there, Mohammed? I'll give it just another second. You are mute, Mohammed. You are mute. Oh. Mohammed, are you there? If you're muted, we, we can't hear you now. <laughs> okay, sorry for that. Well, I, I mean that when we talk about when we talk about solidarity, it means hope for us. And that's what we need. We need hope for our children. We need hope for our people here that they, they are not left alone. People are caring. And this is the right moment to have a loud shouting for all over the world that it's enough. We have been living in this situation since 75 years. It's enough for us. We as people, we want to be sure that we are part of the internationals. We are part of the global. We are part of the world. Solidarity is the time for you nowadays to go out 
to shout, you, friends, anyone, that it is enough. Madness of power, it's killing all over the world. It should be stopped. It's the time that people could come together. I could see it clearly, it could happen because this is the way that we can change the world. That there is, it won't be have weak people and strong people. People are the same. We want to feel that we are part of the internationals. We are part of the world. We are part of those people in all over. We don't want just to carry our children to their graves and bury them while they are still have time to spend, to see more. It's too, we are so tired. Really, we are so tired. And it's time that we could feel that the world starts to see that we are like you. We need somebody to feel that it's the time that the Palestinians have to come up to stand for their rights and for their freedom. I hope that the solidarities with the Palestinians will have the change, will do the change, and will be great to have it. Thank you for today. Thank you, Mohammed, and thank you for all of our speakers, to you, Mustafa, and you, Samiha. Samiha, I thought what you said uh, is very powerful also, and a, a right note to end on, that these aren't stories from a book. These are stories from your lives, from yesterday, from these past days. Uh, and we don't take it for granted that you're here to share them with us um, and give us the information we need to work in solidarity. Um, but of course, we should make clear and I'm in this moment feeling very strongly that it shouldn't be necessary. We shouldn't need to hear these stories and you shouldn't feel like you need to advocate for yourself in this way to have people respect your humanity. Um, so with that, uh, I just want to say thank you. Samiha, also our thoughts are with your father and your cousin, wishing them a speedy recovery. Uh, Mohammed Mustafa, may everyone in your communities be safe. Uh, thank you for teaching us so much today and for all the important and critical perspective you've provided. Uh, I'm excited and we, I agree and all of are excited to continue these conversations and continue building solidarity. Um, and I want to just end by saying once more that following our conversation today, uh, each of you on this call also now has a relationship to Samiha, Mustafa, Muhammad in their communities. We hope you will take what you heard as a charge towards action in a moment in which we as an international community must do everything we can to demand an immediate ceasefire. Now is the time, as each of our speakers said, to demonstrate, to write your elected officials, sign petitions, attend town halls, disrupt meetings, act in civil disobedience, share what you learned today with your peers and do anything we can to amplify the voices here today and the voices of Palestinians facing imminent displacement and even massacre. Uh, we stand with all those calling not for reprisal, but for a just and lasting peace and an end to occupation. We invite you to join us this coming Sunday, October 29th at 1 p.m. EST for the next webinar, uh, our emergency webinar series, giving people around the world a platform to hear directly from Palestinians in their own words and in this moment of severe urgency. We close by sharing now in the chat just before that, can we just say something together for Palestine? Because that's important. I think that's maybe mean a lot if we record this. Just we repeat this. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Hurriye, hurriye, hurriye. One can moment. Can we that together? Of course. Thank you for the suggestion. Us, I'm, without I'm going to take just a second to change the settings so people can unmute themselves. Yeah, please. And then we'll do exactly, as you say, a beautiful ending note and powerful. One moment. Did the All right. People should be able to unmute themselves now. Mustafa, do you want to lead the chant now? And then people will repeat after you. You're muted, Mustafa. <laughs>
Now there's some malfunction. Try once more, Mustafa. There you go. Now, thank you. Okay, I just repeat that with me. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. We shared in the chat also a link to donate to the Palestine Children's Relief Fund that provides medical relief emergency services in Gaza. Take a look at that. Uh, join us on Sunday. We're excited to join together for further conversations. Thanks for your patience as we all learn together how to respond to this moment and have lovely days. Uh, we wish everyone a peaceful time and we'll see you soon. Goodbye, Mustafa, Samia, and Mohammed. Talk Bye. to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.